Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sound Strategic. I'm Maya Nowens. In today's episode, we're taking a look at this year's edition of the IISS's flagship publication, The Military Balance 2021. Military Balance features updated data on the military organizations, equipment, inventories, and defense budgets of 171 countries. It also includes analysis of major developments across defense policy and procurement and defense economics across geographic regions and domains. Joining me today to discuss some of the key findings in this year's book are my colleagues Manella McGerty and Henry Boyd. Manella is a senior fellow for defense economics and has over a decade experience in the field. She's responsible for the Institute's defense economics research and data presented in the Military Balance and Military Balance Plus online database, and she specializes in Europe and the Middle East and North Africa's defense industry analysis. Henry Boyd is research fellow for defense and military analysis. Henry is a key contributor to the Military Balance and Military Balance Plus online database and oversees the defense-related sections of other institute publications, research, and consultancy work. Henry has worked at the Institute for over a decade and is specialized in particular in the modernization and force dispositions of China, Russia, and the U.S.'s militaries. Thanks for joining me both today. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for having me back on. It's a pleasure to be back. So let's start with some of the big defense headlines from last year. Henry, what would you say that is? Well, it's, it, I think it's interesting because it's almost a year where the biggest defense headlines are second order effects of the big global headlines. There's no getting away from 2020 as a year sort of bookended by COVID pandemic to start with and continuing and a, a US election at the end and a, a fairly um, landmark US election in various ways. And it's interesting to look at the, the way defense has had to react to both of those events in both in both in say the US and Europe, but also around the rest of the world. Fidela, what impact has COVID had on defense spending and procurement in particular? So I think from a, a defense economics uh, perspective, I think what's been really interesting is the stronger growth um, in spending that was achieved in 2019 was then maintained in 2020, uh, around 3.9% uh, uh, in real terms. So given that we had wider economic difficulties, um, we still saw defence spending maintained and even increased across across regions. Um, and that's even despite fiscal deficits extending and um, economic output contracting. So a lot of the time when these decisions were made, the outlook was even more negative than it is now. I think there were projections that the global economic output would contract by up to sort of 5%. Uh, and it's now looking closer to, to 35 So even when the outlook was really bleak, countries were still committing to defence. Um, and we also saw spending as a proportion of GDP globally increase um, for, uh, to beyond 2% of, of GDP. And uh, that's really interesting as well. So obviously you have that economic contraction factoring in, but even before that happened, it, there was an upward trend uh, as a proportion of GDP. So I think generally the the, the focus on defence that, that, that was continued and maintained despite wider difficulties is, is really key last year. And it looks to be continuing this year. Beyond that, I think it might start to uh, be a bit trickier to maintain spending at these levels, uh, just as as fiscal realities kind of start to bite. I think it's, it's interesting that again, yeah, the it's not. I mean, where you might expect the economic impact to be the major one on defence from COVID, it, in the short term, it's really had its main impact. I think in things like training, some of the, like large scale exercise and training that was planned for twenty twenty have obviously had suffered from the same effects everyone else has suffered from trying to organize get togethers of large numbers of people. Um, so South Korea had planned an exercise in the US to test full operational control for South Korean adoption of wartime operational control. Um, that's been cancelled. Um, and now that's that puts question marks over the 2022 um, ambition for South Korea to, to assume that operational control were in Europe, there was um, the US and NATO had planned a sort of a major um, combined exercise defending defending Europe 2020, defending Europe 2020. Sorry, um, which was both to test the US's ability to transfer large and large scale forces from the continental United States to Europe, but also intended to test uh, the operational readiness of um, NATO's 4x30 plans. Um, and the curtail, like some of that exercise still managed to go ahead, but the, the way it was curtailed leaves some question marks, particularly on the NATO side, of exactly where we are in terms of 4x30s deliverables. 
I, I think I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the defense spending side. Um, so in, in, in Europe, it wasn't uh, programs that were cut as it, as, as it were um, back in the last sort of financial crisis where discretionary spending and investment was really impacted. Uh, this year, we still had announcements that major procurement programs were still going to proceed, certainly in Europe, say with uh, the, the Finland HX program and uh, the, the Swiss referendum um, voting yes for the, the, the air defence and um, fighter program there. So uh, I think I think that's certainly maybe a lesson learned where, um, you know, you could cut these programs, but eventually you sort of end up losing those capabilities and perhaps spending more in the future if, if you if you make those drastic decisions sort of as a knee-jerk reaction. I mean, let, let's talk about Europe a little bit more in detail. Penella, with regards to NATO, what did NATO defense spending look like in this year's book? Um, so the, the interesting thing with NATO is that um, we have seen um, defense spending sort of as a proportion of GDP increase for the last six years. So even though you have that kind of distortion in 2020 because of those uh, massive contractions in GDP, even before that spending had increased uh, as a on average as a proportion of GDP. So uh, back in 2014, it was uh, under 1.3 percent, um, and by uh, 2019, we were looking at um, kind of closer to uh, 1.5 percent, and now we're at 1.6, uh, 1.64 percent. I think this year uh, in 2020, rather. So I think even though you do have that distortionary effect, there was still that increase. Um, across the board. And I think the other element is that a lot of European countries um, have bolstered that commitment to defence, even uh, over the last year or so, where there was uh, significant defence industrial support programmes implemented uh, by France and Germany, certainly. And I think another kind of surprising one was Italy, where we saw quite a big defence budget increase in 2020, and that still seems to be in, um, continued in 2021. So these uh, these countries again are still bolstering that commitment, um, but again, you always have to have the caveat that um, beyond 2022, difficulties might arise. Um, and uh, given that European spending has only just recovered to pre-pandemic levels, uh, it's still kind of lower than it would have been had the had the global financial crisis sort of not happened. So that pressure to to increase spending is is still there to to cover those. Uh, capabilities that weren't able to be funded in that 10-year period. It's, an int- it's interesting to look at the kind of Europe in a kind of good news, bad news sense in terms of their, their level of defence capability uptick in the last year. In that, uh, on the one hand, I think it's laid out quite clearly, there's, there is a, a genuine element of progress in European capabilities as, as the further spending comes online. The Europeans have been slowly but surely reacting to um, essentially the uh, Russian activity in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine from 2014 onwards and readjusting to a kind of a level of defence requirement that had, had previously kind of been a much, sort of much lower and much further away I see, for Europe. Um, but at the same time, you have this kind of, this is predicated on NATO's European members being adjuncts to a primarily US-driven capability package for Europe. And so you have the, the kind of the event stroke non-event from the middle of last year where the Trump administration announces its, its plans to make a, a series of plans to withdraw or redistribute forces across Europe um, for a, a, sort of a lower level of capability. So throwing the exactly how much U.S. capability can the Europeans rely on? How much is, U, is the U.S. going to ask? Now, the Biden administration, subsequently Congress and the Biden administration have halted the Trump administration's plans pending a wider global posture view that is on, that is now to be ongoing, uh, run by the new Secretary of State's Defense. But that doesn't that halted doesn't necessarily mean cancelled. And if you look at the announced plans, it, there's a disentangling the Trump rhetoric from kind of underlying Pentagon rationale for a lot of the moves they were suggesting suggests to me that there is still a strong possibility that the US will, will want to redistribute its force posture globally and will want to make reductions or changes to its European commitments to support greater contingency elsewhere. So I think you've got European states who are like fe- feeling good about being on course towards the target they set themselves maybe five or six years ago for that level of capability now necess- maybe being asked to do more even 
and how they could how they react in a kind of, in a sort of post COVID environment to to a, any U.S. requirements of further demands on. Well, maybe you're now going to have to cover even more of the NATO requirement for a Russia contingency because we're bu- we're going to be busy elsewhere. Yeah, I think the pressure will still remain um, f- from Biden. Um, it might just be applied perhaps in a more diplomatic or constructive way where, um, you know, regardless of the president or the political party that's been in charge, that pressure on NATO to up spending, to increase investment and reorient defence spending towards acquisitions, that's really been stepped up in the last like, at least 15 years. Uh, Trump was perhaps just a bit more forthright about it. Just a little. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't just that pressure that caused the increase Um it it just it took countries a while to recover from the last from the financial crisis and you know they had a huge other other spending priorities pulling them uh, away away from defense in that time um it was only sort of 2014 with with russia's uh, annexation of crimea that we see that step change that reversal of trend uh, those increases come in so it was kind of all three acting at the same time that that caused the increase i was going to say that one of the uh, the other points that kind of is becoming more noticeable in European defence con- conversations. Is is it's not just about Europe and the US vis-a-vis Russia. There is also the China question is becoming less of a kind of an outlier and more of a mainstream question for European defence spending um, and US demand signals for not just to do more vis-a-vis Russia but to do more elsewhere in the world is, is another kind of major topic of conversation for European defence establishments right now. And let's move on to that topic. So looking at the Asia Pacific. Um, and I love what were spending trends uh, in the Asia Pacific region uh, last year? Um, sure. So we did see a slight slowdown. Um, so if we look at uh, Russia, um, uh, China, for instance, um, defense budget growth slowed to about 5.2% from 5.9% last year. So it slowed, but it's still a significant increase, kind of $12, $12 billion. Uh, which was the same as the increase across Asia, because wider Asia spending did slow down as well. Um, countries uh, like um, Indonesia and South Korea and uh, Taiwan, to different extents, had to adjust their 2020 spending, um, and, and they did that sort of far more immediately. And across, and but generally, the countries are still increasing. It's just a slight um, readjustment to spending rather than any cuts to the previous year. Uh, but that that slowdown um, in 2020 may may still persist into 2021, and with that that confluence, you may have those increases in that recommitment in Europe, meaning that Europe's the fastest growing region in terms of defence spending next year, uh, potentially kind of overtaking the growth of Asia. Obviously, that all hinges on on plans going forward, as as currently stated. Uh, but if if we look across the board in Asia, there were countries, um, certainly South Korea, massively slowed growth in spending. I think it was 9% in 20, uh, 2019, and it was about 2 or 3% in 2020. And that's obviously a huge uh, key market in the rest of Asia, sort of outside of China. But that, the wider Asia trend does tend to mask performance of perhaps smaller or, or um, emerging markets uh, within the region who are perhaps less exposed to that huge domestic demand of China. So even though uh, overall the spending is growing and the economies uh, as a whole aren't being as impacted as much as um, as other regions in the world, that does mask the potentially poor performance of, of other countries uh, within the region. And who are those smaller emerging markets that you just referenced? Well, so Thailand was um, actually one that um, had to implement a cut in 2020. It wasn't a, a downgrade of growth. It was actually a cut. Um, so these these kind of countries are finding that because they have that quite significant reliance on tourism uh, services and things like that. And uh, even though pandemic management on the whole in Asia has been slightly better, I, I don't know if you can sort of call it that, but um, the costs have certainly been lower. I think of the something like $14 trillion that have been spent globally on fiscal support measures, things like the furlough scheme in the UK, uh, $11 trillion of that was advanced markets. So that's really causing um, you know, quite a strain on those markets, but the costs are, are slightly lower in Asia. Uh, but that doesn't mean there won't be costs. The cost of uh, distributing the vaccine and the infrastructure required perhaps isn't quite there for these smaller markets, which I think will create challenges within themselves. I think it's interesting to look at that kind of diversity of 
Asian defense kind of requirements and situations within the kind of the, the I mean the broad picture on Asia is is traditionally depicted as obviously kind of it's a US China rivalry. This is a great power competition. This is the, this is the, the kind of the centerpiece geographically of this great power competition. Um, and this is the dominant defense story of the region, but it's not the only one. And if you're looking country to country, it's interesting to see how the impact of the of, of a kind of potential great power competition in the region has 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 challenged various different defense establishments. I think I kind of South Korea is an interesting one, a kind of traditional U.S. ally, but uh, tradition. I mean, has a historically this a, a clear kind of single target defense policy. North Korea is the overwhelming concern. This is what the defense policy is built around. But and the so defense reform 2.0 under the Moon administration has begun to try and broaden that out because the con- concerns about um, rising tensions in, in, in Asia more widely. It's and thereby sort of Korea's relationship both with Japan and with China have sort of driven a, a kind of a, a push for a kind of a, an equivalent defense response and a heavy investment in kind of advanced technology as part of that response. But that plan is obviously it's expensive and it requires money. And looking looking at the kind of South Korea's budgetary trend so over the over the years up to twenty nineteen is is one of steady increase. And then after twenty nineteen then sort of are we are we looking at a kind of a blip for South Korea? Or are we going to? Are we are we seeing something that's going to be a bit more more of a challenging kind of how do you, how do you try and implement expensive defense modernization and reorganization, but on a slightly more constrained budget? And that the way the kind of U.S. China issue begins to impinge upon local security concerns of states, I think, is something that that's going to complicate their their management of of, of defense spending, the kind of the immediate priority versus the need the need to hedge against a kind of a, a sort of slightly more distant but more destructive aspect i mean if you're taiwan this is less of an issue because the sort of the relationship vis-a-vis china is your number one security concern but for the most other states that's less and less true basically um the further geographically you are away from china and yet you've still all got to adapt to it some way somehow i think yeah the asia asia pacific is likely to be the biggest beneficiary of, of u.s posture reorganizer sort of review and reorganization i think that Without kind of want, wanting to kind of jump too far ahead on that, it's, it's the way the U.S. has set up its kind of defense priorities is a very clear kind of China number one, Russia maybe number two, more everyone else kind of number three basically. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be entirely <laughs> kind of smooth sailing for traditional U.S. allies. Yes, I think they'll probably appreciate the change in tone from the Biden administration. But there's the kind of the practical issues of what the U.S. wants to do defense-wise in the Asia Pacific are still going to remain. The kind of the post-INF missile basing question is still there. The missile defense question is still there. Basing is still a question. And I think th- those are all continuities going forward, despite the change in administration. I mean, let's talk about um, the U.S.'s main security challenge in the Asia Pacific slash Indo Pacific, uh, wherever you sit. Um, China. 2021 marks the end of a five-year plan and the start of a new one. It also marks the end of the first phase of um, China's more recent military uh, reform uh, plans. So, Henry, what does this mean for PLA procurement moving forward? I think we 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 up to an, sort of a, an interesting period of observation that the most likely hypothesis, I think, is an increased investment in what you might call kind of, if you characterize the PLA's um, defense modernization plans of the last 20 years as being attempting to simultaneously catch up and overtake the US, sort of match it by catching up in pre-existing technology and capability whilst investing sufficiently on the R&D and development side that, that they can they can take early leads in, in identify and take leads in, early, in cap- future capability areas so that by the middle of this century, um, the PLA can put itself in a militarily dominant position in most of the Asia Pacific. Um, that we are now in a period where 2020 kind of marked a, to some extent, the kind of, it was meant to mark the symbolic achievement of a large part of the catch up plan, this is what basic mechanization that sort of comprises across most of the services. And while they, I think you would like, Nominally, they didn't make it there. Like you can still see old bits of the PLA, old equipment, obsolete pieces and this equipment. But not to the extent that it really matters. I think that while they may not have achieved 100% of their ambitions, 
getting 90% is is more than more than good enough for most of the PLA. It's a large enough organization. You don't need that that space elsewhere necessarily. Um, but what you're now what you're now really going to have to make to make progress on is the overtake part. And we've seen we've seen PLA investment in the R and D side, and we now now be interesting to see what that translates to in terms of in-service platforms, operational systems, um, new operating concepts. I think, in some ways, I, I'm more confident about seeing them putting, getting the platform and the tech and the metal side of this right. Um, I think it's what's going to be more challenging for them. It has been in the past is getting the soft side of this correct, getting the getting their the, the training, the organization, and the um, the kind of slickness of command and control and interface right for for that for that side. And that I think is probably going to going to be where you see an emphasis in terms of internal PLA um propaganda is the wrong term, but kind of in, in their internal writings and advocacy in terms in terms of what, what the higher command want out of successful officers is emphasizing the need for what they see in in terms of the softer side to make better use of new tech new capabilities. So I think that shift is reflected in, in defense spending um, the, uh, within China. So, you know, 08 to um, 2015, there was significant growth in, in China's budget, uh, double digits uh, in some years. Uh, but that growth has slowed in recent years as, as, as China has reached that um, that level of, uh, of intent. So back in 2008, uh, China accounted for about a third of of regional of Asia Asia spending, uh, and now it's almost uh, com- coming up to equaling the rest of the countries combined. Um, we're about forty five percent of the region is is China now, and you can really see that marked growth where it's outpaced the growth of of wider Asia. But you know, as as the the country kind of reorients and moves into that development phase, um, that as Henry says, is is expensive and it does require that investment in R and D, um, which which can increase uh, costs substantially because you're not you're no longer adapting existing technologies. You're devising um, sort of new ones. You're being the leader rather than the um, adopter. How does that complicate how we calculate Chinese defense spending, which is already quite opaque in and of itself? Um, if we move towards more advanced technologies, which might in, in China's efforts of military civil fusion include more um, participation by China's private sector, what how does that affect our ability to get a good grip on what China's actual military spending is? I think it, it will certainly uh, create challenges where that's the area of spending that there is the least um, transparency in uh, in China. So um, we do have kind of the official estimates and um, some some wider elements of spending that you can add in, but uh, there comes to like it, it comes to a point where you kind of have to make that call, and without the level of detail, without the level of transparency required, it can become very difficult. And if if China is now uh, moving into these more um, technologically advanced or, or innovative um, areas or capabilities, where there is this huge competition for now, and all countries are starting to to really gear up towards them. So the UK's spending review had this huge increase for defence, so 16.5 billion over the next four, four years. Uh, a lot of that uplift was ring-fenced for these these new capabilities. Um, that said, you know, the UK was a bit more transparent about it with the breakdown as to what's going where. Um, so I, I don't think we'll necessarily get that from China if, if uh if history is is any kind of indication, so it will make things slightly more difficult, and it will require tracking what those programs are and kind of estimating the costs, uh, seeing the outputs, and then deriving an estimate from that. I think, um, yeah, transparency wise, it's 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 going to create even more challenges. I just think it's, it's worth just as sort of a, a kind of a note of we are at the almost the start of a twenty 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 thirty five PLA timeframe now between waypoints. That we're building on work already done, but this isn't this isn't something that's going to transform overnight. And the and what we're we're likely to see in the next five years is the starting work towards where the PLA wants to be at twenty thirty five, and the kind that their kind of incorporation of the first steps of this. I, I think where the PLA goes on unmanned is a really interesting question because a lot of their emphasis on the role of artificial intelligence and intelligenceization in military modernization um, has obvious applications in the unmanned field, 
up until now we've seen the PLA make some use of unmanned platforms, but not in, not in the kind of the, the centerpiece of their organization, um, either air, land, sea. Um, but they're clearly like multiple programs in all domains that are kind of experimenting with them at this point in time. And what we, we might be, we might see more and more of those programs begin to bear fruit in terms of operational capability over the next five years. I think that's a particular area of interest to look forward to. Henry, in terms of how the PLA was tested in 2020, um, we saw a number of, of, of ways in which it was. We can think about um, how it put some of its lessons learned from military modernization efforts into practice along uh, the disputed India-China border in the clash that we saw there during the summer of 2020. There's, of course, been an uptake in activity around Taiwan. Um, but the PLA, of course, also played a significant role in China's COVID response. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's, it's an interesting aspect of PLA capability that doesn't get and all, it's it's less flashy than sort of major combat platforms, but the role the Joint Logistic Support Force plays in the PLA's real, sort of modernization plan is worth bearing in mind. And the kind of the way that presents a gap capability is tied to one of the ideas behind this re- most recent round of reorganization is a kind of a smaller but but kind of more deployable, more mobile PLA. Um, you're looking at alongside. Like, extensive photo shoot efforts highlighting the role of the new heavy transport aircraft, the Y-20, in delivering both inside the country, but also outside the country, sort of COVID relief supplies. Um, Looking at the uh, kind of the efforts in terms of uh, the way the the PLA led a domestic response in, in in a kind of (laughs) <laughs> comparatively in in a positive light that kind of the, the role of the pla internally traditionally is kind of seen seen as this kind of the the, the, the state in force or the, the the security force at tiananmen square at sort of analogs their their job their job is to enforce regimes but in a kind in it playing a an in sort of an internal an internal role that is in sort of more kind of pr friendly to put it that way um i, I think it, it highlights the 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 pro, some of the the progress made but the importance placed upon the ability of moving stuff around inside the country at speed at the response process organizing this kind of distribution of supply um there some kind of the long term focus on power projection outside of china i think also masks a little bit of the importance of power, for the pla of power projection inside china that not just COVID, but the connect the the India um, the, the confrontation on the Ladakh border, which is um, amongst the most inhosp- inhospitable pieces of terrain known to man, and keeping getting military supplies up there and sustained is a real challenge. And the the kind of the lengths lengths to which um, both India and China had went to to finding ways to reinforce and supply these reinforcements across the kind of high altitude mountainous border. Um, logistics is that, that perennial kind, the perennial kind of military overlook. That this is, it's it's a, a huge part of any successful campaign, but rarely gets the kind of the pre-war attention it deserves because it's just not as glamorous. You don't make you don't. It's not it's not doesn't make as good front cover page. A load of people moving boxes around as, as a new fighter aircraft or missile does. Um, but I think the PLA is very very well aware of how central the success of the JLF JLSF concept is to the wider PLA. Uh, military modernization efforts. I don't think they're skimping on fo- on the, the resourcing needed there, despite the higher profile perhaps given to the the main services of the or the, the rocket force and the strategic support force. Um, I think the JLSF is 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 worth considering as a kind of a major PLA asset in its own right, really. And for our non PLA watcher listeners, the JLSF is the Joint Logistic Support Force. Um, just. I think that that also points to a kind of wider trend of, of what the role of defence and that blurring between defence and security and trying to determine uh, how much sort of within uh, budgets is allocated to both and what the wider responsibilities of the defence um, kind of framework is. Um, we did see um, def- defence forces get uh, deployed, involved in COVID response measures. And I think... Uh, there are some countries that are already kind of prepared for this. They already had crisis response as part of uh, separate budget lines, certainly in, in, in Scandinavian countries we saw this. 
Um, and I think countries uh, will will start to to make that shift, that rec- that real recognition that that this kind of uh, role has to be funded and um, in some ways prioritized because if uh, if you know these crises kind of happen again or if there's it's more of a climate based threat it's adopting adapting to these these new kind of threats that require slightly different response slightly different capabilities um slightly different um uh, ways of responding to it as well now we focused a lot uh, in the past year about great power competition received a lot of headlines what about the rest of the world outside of Europe and Asia? Um, Penella, what were the spending trends in the Middle East and Africa, areas where, of course, conflicts are ongoing and very much active? Sure. So I think we did see spending um, kind of in line with the poor performance of oil prices, um, certainly in the last few years. So uh, Middle East spending has uh, contracted for the third consecutive year in 2020. and Certainly, 2021, Saudi Arabia has, has also implemented a, a cut again. So um, that has meant that what was quite a strong growth market um, was key for defense exports of, of uh, suppliers. And it's meant that as a share of global spending, uh, the region is now kind of less than 10%. It's closer to sort of 8.5, where it was above uh, nearly 11% a few years ago. So it was accounting for, for quite a big share. And even though it wasn't accounting for, um, say, as much as you know Asia or Europe, in terms of procurement spending, because of the orientation of the budget, because of the reliance on foreign suppliers, uh, the Middle East accounted for a far greater proportion of, of, of defense trade, of, of exports. So it was this key market, and it was key to the recovery uh, from the financial from, of defence spending from the fast financial crisis, so if um, if countries aren't able to return to kind of fiscal uh, stability, if the oil price remains below those fiscal break even points that, that countries need, um, we do run the risk of of further cuts, of further destabilisation in, in certain regions, which which are already kind of facing significant struggles, um, which again prevent presents a uh, wider security concern for for Europe for um, for the regional allies as well. Uh, in Africa, uh, spending actually was was performed quite well last year. Certain countries implemented quite strong increases. So Uganda certainly uh, significant increase last year. Um, but I don't think the the full impact of of the pandemic has really. It's not as far along as perhaps it is in Europe, and of, of also the demographic makeup means that the costs are, are slightly lower and the countries just don't have the fiscal headroom to um, to implement the kind of measures that, that Europe and, and North America have done. So I think as uh, infection rates sort of increase, as new variants come out, the distribution of the vaccine will be incredibly difficult. Europe's obviously already found it extremely difficult so far. So as a uh, as those uh, difficulties extend, you know, the wider distribution networks and infrastructure just kind of isn't there for certain certain vaccines, certainly. Uh, so, again, we see um, the potential for an increase in, in inequality, in an instability uh, that is then sort of bred from that as well. I mean, I, I'd say that you brought up the kind of, we do talk about defence in a primarily in a kind of great power context these days, and I I, I, mean, I don't want to apologise too much for that. I think there, there are good reasons to do so. I think the kind of the potential scale of conflicts between the US, China, and Russia necessitates those being a kind of a focus of international attention. But it is worth bearing in mind. I think you alluded to that, like the wars, the, the wars and conflicts going on today are not in the Asia Pacific littoral or in sort of Central and Western Europe. It's we're looking at the Caucasus, we're looking at the we're looking at the Middle East, the Levant, we're looking at sort of East Africa, West Africa, um, and the impact of a a kind of reduction, any reduction of attention that uh, increasing focus on great power competition will bring to those conflicts is not likely to be positive necessarily. Um, we're already seeing concerns about the the relative uh, sort of emphasis on proxy wars to some extent, but certainly proxy capability to sort of sponsorship in places like Libya, where um, both sides have received um, substantive external support on the, on the one side from Turkey and the other from a combination of UAE um, 
Russian private military contractors and Egypt as well, um, sort of creating a more a, sort of a more difficult sort of <laughs> conflict resolution picture in Libya, as it were. As it, the, the more external actors are involved, the more complex it is to solve conflict dynamics. Um, in East Africa, you see you see a kind of a, maybe a concerning situation where simultaneously the U.S. has has drawn down its presence in Somalia. Amasom is is contemplating a, a, a sort of a withdrawal from Somalia in the near future. Ethiopia, which has often been the kind of the the regional actor who who stepped into the sort of the the military provision breach in terms of sort of external support and stability provision in in UN missions or, or just national deployments in East Africa had its its own civil conflict with um, the Tigrayans um, in late 2020 and it has sort of border issues now with Sudan. And so the prospect of both external and local actors being struggling to find the resource and capability, having to focus elsewhere and, and not being able to provide the same level of attention that places like Somalia had previously received from the wider community um, might seriously complex sort of... Um, complicate the security situation in these countries are the somali secure is, is somali defense forces ready to take a, take on responsibility probably not judging by some fairly scathing external reviews of their capability in recent years but what what's the alternative going to be I mean, if the us the us feels it has to take capability out of europe to provide for greater contingency elsewhere it's unlikely to be able to provide additional forces for, for sub-saharan africa um russia neither russia or china for differing reasons seem particularly placed to fill that gap neither do the europeans um so i i think there's a concern that some to some extent local conflicts will <laughs> receive less kind of conflict resolution support or less kind of security stresses um security and stability support but not necessarily less involvement if proxyism becomes more of a thing and countries seem to seem more more inclined to get involved on one side or the other for the role the conflict might play in wider geopolitics rather than addressing the sort of the local issues of the conflict themselves. And I think that's a real concern in the coming years for um, the kind of the, both the Middle East and for sub-Saharan Africa. I think if, if we're talking, yeah, regional stabilizers, the, the impact on, on South Africa where um, it's, it was one of the, the biggest spenders in sub-Saharan Africa and it still is, but it's, it's not been able to implement uh, defence spending increases for a good five years now, and I think quite often the country defers increases in spending further to the right, and that was even before the pandemic hit and that and the new variant emerged, and the country um, had to respond to that. So, given that the country has already um, offset defence spending increases and perhaps pulled back from the region, um, that stabilising force is also. Um, Sort of slightly lost and it has the potential to, to further retract if um, if the country is unable to uh, to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. Last year, we also saw a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, Henry, can you talk a little bit about the role of unmanned systems? It's in, it's kind of indicative of the kind of year we have had in terms of the, the various demands on people's attention that a, a kind of a war between two two kind of mid sized states. Um, over over a long standing kind of frozen conflict, ultimately sort of seem is kind of a, is a second or third order headline of of the year, the year's deliverables. But I think it's what's really interesting to me is the military writing response to the Armenian the, sort of the Nagorno Karabakh war is the English language response seems to focus quite heavily on the role the UAVs and large munitions play. The Russian language response seems to go in the other direction. That, see, that seek, seeks to kind of emphasize how how important other stuff was as well, and that we shouldn't pay too much attention to. Yes, yes, they yes they were very high profile, and just because you have a lot of camera footage from the Azeri operation doesn't necessarily mean that since you weren't seeing others weren't seeing the other stuff that that's the proportion of, of that's how the conflict was won. Um, and I think we're in a kind of still in a disentangling phase about what there's lots of people offering lessons to be drawn from this conflict for various militaries. I think we're still in the phase of trying to disentangle what is specific to this particular scenario. I mean, what was Armenia Azerbaijan specific and what could be more, what, what kind of generalized lessons could be drawn for other militaries in different parts of the world for the, both the effect of these systems, for how to counter them and for what, what the kind of balance between investment, what the balance of investment should be for militaries looking to kind of 
gear themselves up for one for one better 20, 21st century warfare. Well, thanks very much again, Anella and Henry, for speaking with me today. Thank you very much indeed, Maya. Pleasure to be back. Hopefully back again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'll, I'll, I'll see you on the next one. And we hope you enjoyed today's episode as well. To purchase this year's Military Balance book and for more information on the book, head to the IISS website, iiss.org. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And for the latest analysis on international defense and security issues, visit the IISS website and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. See you all next time.